Hey Outlaws, Joe here with my couple of minutes announcements at the beginning of this episode. And I wanted to take a moment first to remind everybody that uh, we've got a contest going on for a copy of Nippon. Just go and leave us a review on iTunes or drop us a review on any other system that you use uh, to listen to this podcast. And uh, if you do anything besides iTunes, we're not going to get you automatically, so you need to send an email to goodboardugly at gmail.com. Together with uh, the review that you left, we're going to thank everybody on a later podcast episode. I also wanted to just remember all the people right now who are dealing with really tough jobs. Um, and I mean, a lot of the business world is dealing with some really difficult stuff. Specifically, uh, public accountants right now are kind of getting into the thick of things. And I, I don't think a lot of us realize how much work uh, ends up happening as a result of, of these year-end deadlines and whatnot. And really, uh, lives can become very disrupted by that. So anyway, if that's you, um, you know, just wanted you to know my heart's out there for you. And I hope that this is a, a relatively painless, busy season for you, as well as anybody out there who's commuting, you know, uh, that commute can get to you. And I hope that this podcast helps uh, with any of that frustrations or helps you deal with your road rage a little bit better. So hopefully, uh, hopefully just getting remembered a little bit, puts a little smile on your face and makes it a little bit easier to go about those days. Uh, tasks that you do, and a lot of times you don't get the thanks you deserve. So anyway, thanks for listening, and enjoy episode 148, my top games and disappointments of 2017. You are listening to The Good, The Bored, and The Ugly. Join hosts Joe Salin, Speak of the devil, and they shall appear. Trent Ham. What is your major Andrew Dennison. Get off my train! And T.C. Reed. Looks like we might be due for a big old storm of chaos. And other guest outlaws as they discuss games and topics in the board game industry. All episodes of the GBU are recorded live. Follow us on YouTube for your chance to participate in future episodes. All future recordings and topics are posted on Board Game Geek Guild 2173. And now it's time for the good, the bored, and the other. Hello, and welcome to The Good, The Bored, and The Ugly, a podcast about board games. I'm the host, and somehow this episode's going to focus on me tonight by some mistake somebody made in planning, <laughs> or just lazy. I'm Joe Salen. I'm being joined tonight. That's uh, out on the Portland West Coast, weird and beautiful town, and TC, how are you doing tonight? Very good. I almost forgot we were podcasting tonight. <laughs> Thank you I for reminding that. me. Yeah, I was- that was sweet because, you know, I only spent like last night, you know, I, I spent like two, three hours putting together this list and everything. And when I got that list, I was like, I got that message, like, are we recording tonight? And I was like, <laughs> sorry. The reaction was a large breathe through my nose. Like, <laughs> oh, <sighs> oh, oh, yeah, yeah. You can't reward your hard work by saying I can't make it right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Last minute, please, too. Last minute. Oh, wait, we're not recording, are we? Oh, mm. 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 <laughs> <laughs> TC, you're not the type of guy to do that. That's TC Reed, everybody. Good to see you, Joe. So, yeah, yeah, good to be here with you. And I've also got Trent ha- Ham. And Trent, you have uh, been saving the world, and you missed our last episode, but right? Or yeah, but I, now I wasn't here last week for a, a, a personal emergency. Let's leave it at that. Yeah, he was he was saving the world. He's not going to say it himself, but he was definitely doing some good. So anyway, uh, that's Trent. I'm glad that that sort of situation um, that you were able to help. And also, people will be looking forward to hearing back from you uh, after that week off. So um, I myself am looking forward to that. Uh, tonight's okay, topic. Yeah, here we go. Tonight's topic. My top games of 2017. I said top 10 because I feel like for some reason people are going to click on it for that. I'm I've just become such such a sellout to those top 10 things, but I'm not actually going to change my format. I've got the amount of games I felt like putting on here organized the way I felt like doing it. And we'll get to that when, once we actually uh, finish our review section at the, at the front here, but that's uh, one of, one of my favorite parts. So let's not get through that too quickly before we get started with that. Thanks to our sponsor game surplus, go check them out. Gamesurplus.com. Go to the podcast picks, find the good, the board and the ugly podcast picks type in good board, ugly picks in the coupons. 
Uh, that's all one word, good board, ugly picks. You'll be able to get 10% off. They're already discounted prices, free shipping at $90. Pretty good place to get your games. So gamesurplus.com, go check them out. Let's go ahead and kick it off with reviews with the guy who missed last week because I want to hear your sweet, bassy voice, Trent, and not just to quote Tuesdays with Maury. Okay. Um, <laughs> I'm actually not sure what to review right now. So I guess I'll go with uh, Table Battles. So Table Battles is a game um, published by Holland Spiel and designed by the primary operator of Holland Spiel, uh, Tom Russell. Um Table Battles is a two-player simple card dueling game, honestly, uh, with a different theme that honestly could have been uh, any number of things because it feels like what it feels a lot like a two-player card battling duel game is what it feels like. Uh, Ascension or not Ascension? I'm like a Legend of the Five Rings or anything like that. Except you don't build hmm. your own deck. You start off with all your cards on the table. After that, it feels like a card dueling game to me because you're going back and forth, taking turns, performing actions, and so on. What you essentially do is you have the, the table battles are meant to recreate historical battles. And so at the start of the game, the game tells you, oh, you have this army and the other player has this army. Or you have these two armies and the other player just has one army. Our army is represented by a set of some number of cards two, three, four, five cards, something like that, depending on the specific army. So you start off with some number of cards in play. Each card has a number of hit points on it. And uh, there's a number of special abilities that they each have and so forth. But what's interesting is, is it says on each card who they're able to target on the other side of the table. So your card will say something like, I can only target three of your six units with this card that I have, or I can only target two of your six units with this other card. But there's specific ones. So the way the game goes is it goes back and forth where you're basically rolling dice and then assigning those dice to cards in front of you. And then the other player goes and they can roll dice and assign or roll dice and assign them to their cards. And then it comes back to you and you resolve any of the dice that you so choose to resolve. So you might be able to take some of the dice off of some of the cards and some effect will happen. Like it will, you take two dice off of one of the cards that can attack another card and it does two damage to them. Now they might have some dice on there and they might have an effect that lets them defend or not. There's different effects on all the cards. But the key is when you when you remove the dice and you have them back in your pool and you can roll again and put them back on other cards, however you want it. If you leave them on the cards to build up and there are reasons to do that, that means on your turn you're rolling fewer dice. You have a max of only six dice with which you can roll and assign. So there's this kind of back and forth in terms of like what you're going to do with your resources. Um... And the game plays very quickly, and before you know it, the game's over, and you're on to the next one. It's a very quick playing, very straightforward game, nothing complicated about it. It's something that I think could make a good family game, especially for a family that likes, um, for lack of a better way of putting it, historically accurate games. Um, I, I really enjoyed it. I had the opportunity to play it with Andy, who's in here mm -hmm. tonight. Uh, in the past few days, and then also with my own family. And it's been a pretty big hit for what it is with all of them. It's like a really nice little 15-minute game, presents mm -hmm. some interesting choices, reenacts the historical battles somewhat uh, abstractly, but also mm -hmm. in more detail than you might expect because the targeting rules effectively mirror what you might find on a, on a table battle. Like one unit that can only that can't be basically only be targeted by only one of your units might be theoretically something hiding behind a hill. And that's the way the game represents it is that it can only be targeted by a long range unit. And that's effectively what the targeting rules in the cards mean that you can only use this card to attack two other cards on the other side of the table. And it just adds up to a nice light little game. It was almost not even what I was expecting from a uh, Holland's feel in this lightness. Um, I like that the, there are a number of scenarios in the game that present different battles, but the battles are fairly replayable. Um, it's kind of fun to switch sides and try them again. Um, you're going to get a fair amount of play out of the box. Um, the components are fairly straightforward. They're whole and spiel quality. Uh, they're like what I would describe as a really nice print and play. Is pretty much the level of quality of most of the <laughs> productions, hmm. which is perfectly fine. That's what, yeah. that's yeah. what they're shooting for. Um, only odd thing I found is the components, the hit points in this game are weirdly represented by these like matchstick pieces that you sit out in front of the cards. It's kind of a weird way to represent hit points, but 
<laughs> they're like really, probably... really long. You're right. Like like matchsticks is a good word, and it yeah. is kind of bizarre. I'm assuming that just must be the component he found at the right price. Is my guess. I mean, it kind of mm -hmm. works. You can set them out in front of the card, and it looks like a you know like a hit point bar in a video game role playing game or something like that. Kinda, but okay. eh. I just found it to be a nice little light game that's fun to play. It's a lot of dice rolling. There's a fair amount of luck and the determination. Both games I played, I felt like somebody got three or four good rolls in a row and won. But as quick as it plays and as interesting as some of the things are going on in it, and it's very straightforward to teach and learn, I can't really complain with it. And that's Table Battles from Holland's Field. Uh, yeah, I've gotten a chance to play this a couple of times. And I say my feelings mirror your own. I would say that it's it's a little bit less in what I would call my particular wheelhouse. So I, I think that you sound a little bit more optimistic than I generally was. It was, it was fine. Um, I, I would say that we were still working out a lot of the different rules, which it's, it's kind of beautiful how short the rule book is, but it tends to leave a little bit of ambiguity and definitely some space for some easy wrong readings. So I think like you said, Trent, just kind of expect something on the level of a really nice print and play. You're going to be very happy with this. I think that what's cool about the system is, is that it is uh, going further than, than, you know, it doesn't go as far as like, you know, the really in-depth, difficult, high bar of entry uh, simulation battles, but you are largely playing a simulation in the abstract of battles. And th these battles can range from like, a lot of these are like medieval ancient battles and, and it, it can go, you know, across different time periods. So it's a very simple system, but I like how, uh, how much it can be molded to different time frames And, and uh, in, in general, it's definitely one that uh, I wouldn't turn down actively. I just feel like it's a decent little two player filler to play in between something else. And I don't know if it's the best at doing that, but it definitely, you know, is something unique and that's what you expect from Holland Spiel. So I, I, I uh, agree with your review. TC, is this uh this seems like one that I feel like you and your wife would just, you know, this could be like your two player go to. Yeah, the more you guys talk about this one, the more interested I am to play it. I just gotta find a copy, go to Holland Spiel and uh find it. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, every, every, every you've talked about it, dude, all you guys. It's like every time you guys it's like that 4X. I'm like, man, I need to I need to get this game to the table. <laughs> Oh, dude, four X is something else. Four X is really cool. It it really is. Like I, I was surprised, Trent, that four X didn't pop up on your like games of the year. It it did. I think it was like fairly high up, if I remember right. Okay, maybe maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I forget things. All um, right. I thought it was fairly high up, but maybe not. I don't know. It was a long time ago. <laughs> sure, yeah, long it was time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Like a month ago, so yeah. I you can't it. expect me to remember a month ago. <laughs> of course not. Especially at our well, age. <laughs> <laughs> well, TC, now it's up to you to tell us all about, what do you know, another box of stuff from your favorite. You and Jonathan would have just, you know, you guys, I, I wish there was a way for us to get you together because I feel like, in a large way, Gale Force 9 was like his homeboys, and you've largely taken over that role. So tell us about your favorite game from your new homeboys. Okay, well, this is just a, a first impression. I was talk I talked to Curse about this, see if she wanted to come on and talk about it. But we only played it twice, and we really wanted to play it a little bit more before we get a, a really in-depth to it because she wants to be on to talk about it. But I want to briefly talk about the newest expansion of Star Trek Ascendancy, which is Borg Assimilation. Groot! Groot. I like it. Okay, <laughs> wait. <laughs> um, the biggest change this, the Borg Assimilation does is it changes the base game from a three-player only game to a one or two-player game. Because what the Borg are doing, it's an NPC faction that's completely automated on its own. So we, me and Carissa tried it with the Borg as the third player, and it was it was good. There were some problems. The problem with the game comes in that there's these cards that you pull that tell you how the Borg activate. And some of them were a little hazy. I mean, they weren't completely unclear, but it's like, oh, they could, is it going to do this or this? So we need some clarification here. Other than that... It adds an interesting dimension to the game where you're just not look eyeballing each other. You're like, um, 
there's this thing, this cube going down on me. If it attacks me, if you get assimilated by these guys, you actively play them. So you're like, we got to help me with this or I'm going to be coming after you as the Borg. <laughs> it's going to be nasty. And it added quite a bit of length to the game. It added quite a bit of, it, it made it longer. And it, it, I wouldn't say it was more interesting or fun, but it made it different. And that's pretty interesting. Um, I want to play it a few more times to see if I can't get some more clarifications on the rules questions we had. But if you have, if you're a Star Trek fan, and you don't have three people to play this game with because base game essentially does require three. And you just got you and someone else, like you're a two-player, you want to try it solo? It seems to be fairly functional that way. I haven't tried it solo. I've only tried it two. I'm curious to try it at four to see if the the, the board playing the fifth player, how that's going to change things up. I'm. Sh it seems like it's going to be chaotic as all get out, which is what I like in these type of games. So... Uh, first impressions is generally positive. I do think it's a little overpriced for what they're selling. I think it's like 50 bucks. Like, ugh, that's a little much for that. But the components are really good. The board cubes look like the board cubes. The mechanics for how the board fight are good. It's, it's, it's solid. I just want to get a few more plays underneath my, underneath me before I really go in depth on it. But so far it seems to be fairly good. Sounds like the britches are getting a little big for Gale Force Nine's design ambitions. <laughs> it's possible. Oh, and then uh, they also announced the next two expansions for since he's going to be the Andorians and the Vulcans. We'll probably see those in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Take that. <laughs> uh, well, now they're think... actually having to design games and not just print a whole bunch of stuff onto cards and use the artwork from the movies. So, I mean, it's getting kind of tough, man. Yeah, and I'm curious. Um, I, I I don't know if they're because that Doctor Who board game came out and you know only it only shipped with four doctors and there's what 13 of them. So I'm wondering if their resources are going to be a little bit uh, preoccupied pumping out expansions for Doctor Who this year. We'll see. And they also got. I think they've also got like. I was looking, they had like the Dungeons and Dragons license to print accessories to their role playing game. Uh huh. So I just went there to look at so what was coming out. I was like, all this DD &D stuff. So I need to look into that. Cool. So yeah, it seems like Skull Force Line, if they can get their shipping schedule together, they might have a pretty good year this year. But I am a little pessimistic. I'm reading yeah. out the, uh, the choice of using the Vulcans because they're already kind of wrapped into the Federation. Yeah, I know. I thought it was an interesting choice. I mean, so are, the, so are the Andorians, for that matter. So, yeah. well, I, yeah, I, we'll see. I, I figured they'd have the Dominion, but maybe they're going to wait and save that for, like, another larger box like the Borg was. Yeah, that's the rumors that the Dominion's going to be another NPC faction like the Borg. I hope so. I think that would be the right way to do them. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway... A Borg assimilation, a Star Trek fan, you like the Borg. Uh, the biggest complaint my daughter had is she just couldn't outright play the Borg. <laughs> <laughs> she just wants to be evil, TC. Just let the girl be evil. Yeah, and also thanks to you, since we're getting dungeon pets on the table, she says, I want to play a game where I can be evil. I'm like, well, if you like dungeon pets, there's dungeon lords. <laughs> Oh, that is so perfect, man. That is actually, that is great. I hear yes. cool many or not latest Kickstarter would be perfect for that. Oh. oh I went there. You know there. what, though? <laughs> yeah. Is it Cooking hate? Up people or torture yeah. them to death? Yes. <laughs> well, we'll see. <laughs> hey, Kate, we can torture people. Awesome. We're in. <laughs> it's, you know... People have been comparing it kind of to like Kingdom Death Monster, and I would say, yeah, the, the things that you do seem horrible, but at least it doesn't really seem to have that sort of like objectification of women that I see in Kingdom Death Monster. So I I don't know. Personal. I, I, I wouldn't know. I don't have the $400,000 to buy a copy of Kingdom Death Monster to actually see for myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, oh, uh, before I do my review, I wanted to say uh, happy birthday to Christine, Andy's wife. A great day. Um, Anyhow, my review is going to be of This War of Mine, which TC, this, I don't know why, but this one speaks directly to you because it is just like a game that's just going to like hurt you and, and you're going to be like, you're going to be forced with like these just horrible passages um, that you have to read and everything is just going to rip your heart apart and sometimes you're going to keep going through an encounter and the further you go, the more you're like, should we stop? Should we stop? Uh, I feel like we're committed. 
And if you go through to the end, there's almost always just like, you know, congratulations, you did something horrible and you get this good stuff. And these people are probably going to die because of you. Yeah, that sounds just because, like the video, man. <laughs> yeah, it is. So I got a chance to, to show it uh, to an, a group of people that were all new players, um, including uh, my little brother. Uh, this is when I was over in, in Cedar Rapids visiting him. It was uh, a really interesting experience. And I would say that my experience really led me to compare this one to like Robinson Crusoe. Robinson Crusoe uses like a deck of cards to determine your encounters and stuff. Um, and they're really, really cool. And I love the way that they like work into the story. Um, here, you've just kind of got a book of encounters that takes that place. Um, it has a really frustrating system of rules that, you know, you just give it some time and it'll be okay. Um, because a lot of the rules are hidden in that book of encounters in a weird kind of decision. Mm -hmm. And they seem really passionate about this decision to try to make the game more accessible by hiding the rules, which seems kind of funny because the game is really complicated and difficult to play. And when you hide those rules, they just kind of make it more difficult because otherwise players just kind of play through with like, you know, just kind of playing with the ambiguity in their favor. And generally this, the game seems to always want to work against you. So there are times when you're like, I'm not sure. I don't know the game well enough to know if this is supposed to be good for me or bad for me. Cause I know the game hates me. <laughs> and I know the game would want me to play it bad, but I don't know which one's really bad. So I'll just go which with that, with whatever. I don't want to say like a grand old time, but we had, you know, like it was the same types of decisions, like where you're, you're wondering like, how do we build up this, this uh, bombed out shell of a place that we're living in? Um, how do we add the things that will be best for us to help us be the most efficient in getting food and getting water and, and um, you know, like not getting killed and being able to defend ourselves against the night raids that always happen. Um, I'm really interested to see where the direction is going to head with a lot of the different um, Kickstarter. Well, there were not Kickstarter exclusive anything, but it was like kicks. Well, there was some, but I'm not talking about that. There's a lot of different like expansions that added new dimensions to the game. And I'm really looking forward just to trying those to me. Like, you know, I really love Robinson Crusoe and I feel like this year I was hoping to get another Robinson Crusoe with first Martians and I still haven't played it. So I don't know, but let's just say that I've got another one on my plate first and that would be this war of mine that's I, I really want to explore this system the storytelling is at an extremely high level and that's what's most important in a game with the book of scripts it's extremely well written um and i just love like every time i was in the book i just wanted to keep on going through the book and checking out the different things i had to offer and that's to me is a sign of a great story uh, in a game that's where its story is really taking the centerpiece but it has solid enough mechanics for me to invest in the experience have you played the video game i just downloaded it but i've not played it Okay, just curious. Have you? Uh, I I have played both. Um, I think that I find the board game more engaging. Interesting. That's kind of an kind of an accomplishment. It definitely seems like I read the list of what those guys that designed the game have played, and they listed like seven or eight games that are all like, you know, hot topic games right now, like Gloomhaven, Seventh Continent. Uh, they, they of course mentioned like the classic, um, the classic snooze fest, in my opinion of, uh, the tales of the Arabian nights and of, of so many other, like above and below other storytelling games. So it was clear that like their finger on the pulse of the storytelling renaissance that's going on right now. Here's so maybe... my nutshell, here's my nutshell review of the sword of mine. It's the best storytelling game that has yet been made. And I'm going to leave it at that. Whoa. The best period of storytelling games that have yet been made. If you want a game that is going to just, you're concerned about story more than anything else, and you want a really good, compelling story that's actually meaningful, play this one. Mm -hmm. You mean like a pre-constructed story, not one that you yes. create yourself? Like, okay. Where you're like yeah, going like... through a story that's kind of like written out for you, and you're going through it and exploring it through video or board game mechanisms. This is the best one they've ever done. That anyone's ever wow. done that I've ever played. Very high praise. And yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I'm actually kind of shocked. I am taken aback by that. Um, <laughs> board games are getting closer and closer to the experiences that were previously only available with a, a living, you know, skin and bones a dungeon master to, to carry you through. I'm not saying they're, they're, they're getting better than they were. You know, they're getting a lot better. I'm not saying that they're overtaking that, but they are getting better. And a, a board game telling a story is I think something that is really special and something fairly new.
Yeah, I've also heard that it's a pretty rough to get through. Is that true, Trent? That it's like a pretty rough. You're like, oh man, this is this is harsh. <laughs> yes, I mean that's the theme of the game. It's about yeah. it's a, basically a game about post traumatic stress disorder. Let's be honest. Mm -hmm. that's, I mean, that's it what really, it's about. Yeah, it, it almost is like the author of the game, sort of like unpacking a lot of these, a lot of these PS PTSD sort of types of events. And yeah, it, even the ones that don't leave you with any game uh, state that's any worse will still have you just like having your heart ripped in half uh, because of the individuals that you observe. You know that. Like you, you look at these people and they are in a terrible spot. So, yeah, it it it, it has game mechanisms for like you know you have a certain level of of um, misery and you have a level of empathy, which is kind of like your resistance to misery. The higher your empathy is, the more that you're going to be affected by bad events. And it's based on a die roll. A lot of these things are based on a dice, you know, based on dice. But um, it's really strange. You know, like you you can eat a dog. <laughs> In this game, you can have a start with a pet dog, and at any point, you can turn it into four pieces of raw food, and then immediately roll for you know roll to see if your misery gets risen. And it is you know it's that type of thing. It even says in the rule book, like with an exclamation point, "We hope you don't ever use this rule." <laughs> but you can you can cook up a dog. Well, that's this war of mine, and that's my review. But um, it's kind of a segue into my top ten games. Uh, which is definitely a loose interpretation of the number 10. Hey Outlaws, do you like buying games and playing games? Well, I'm sure you do. Luckily, you can save 10% on your favorite games that the good, the bored, and the ugly play on GameSurplus.com. That means you can play your favorite games and get 10% off of them when you become obsessed with them and want to buy it for yourself so you can continue playing until you lose your mind playing it. What do you say we play a little Bangkok rules? During checkout of your GameSurplus.com order, enter code GoodBoardUglyPicks. That's GoodBoardUglyPicks, no spaces, not case sensitive. Enter GoodBoardUglyPicks for 10% off your podcast picks from the good, the bored, and the ugly. Uh, it's going to pop up on my list. The way that I decided to organize my list was I just I put every game on here that I thought was remarkable from this year. A remarkable game. And, uh, you know, ones that rose above, ones that I consider putting on my top games of all time. No, as a matter of fact, I would say these ones will make it on my top games of all time. They will certainly make it on there. Um, so uh, these, in a way, it's going to be kind of new additions, but that list tends to shake out and be different every year I do it. I'm not sure if I'm going to do it this year. What The way that I organized it was in tiers. Because for me, it's, you know, like one, two, three, four, five. Like I did not number it like that. I feel like uh, numbering gets a really arbitrary and I end up choosing between, you know, apples and oranges. And I love them both. I just have different plays, uh, different places and different environments I would play each one. So I'm going to do it in tiers. I've got four different tiers, each one with roughly five games on it. I will first tell you all the games I didn't play so that you don't send me angry emails telling me, why didn't you play this game? So, uh, and then I will go into my five biggest disappointments of the year, and I will finish her up. Well, not finish her up. I'll then go into the meat of my list, finishing with uh, my tier one. So starting at the, the lowest tier, my tier four, and going up to tier one. All right. Wow. So, you put a lot of work into this. <laughs> it has Thank tiers. You. It has tiers. <laughs> well, it does that instead of having numbers. Like, I, I that way, I was actually, I would say that's a cop-out in a way. So it, it made it so that I could put several games at the same level. You know, and not not have like not have to do ties and stuff like that. So, um, yeah. Oh, oh, I'm sorry, I lied. Five tiers, five tiers. So there's five different tiers. All right, uh, my games that I have not yet played, uh, games that I haven't really gotten a chance to check out, and so ones that you will not see pop up on here are the Uwe Rosenberg game Newsfjord, the Seventh Continent, which I'm participating in the new Kickstarter, but haven't got it yet. Haven't got a chance to play Charterstone. Uh, Too many bones. I've never played. Pandemic Legacy Season 2, um, though I am, as, as we mentioned in the comments before, uh, just about halfway through with Pandemic Le Legacy Season 1 and having a real blast. I, I haven't like played... Colonel Sanders had a real bad day. <laughs> yeah, we named our Colonel Colonel Sanders, and unfortunately, uh, yeah, he, he had a bad day and then another bad day afterwards, and 
we ended up destroying our first character. And <laughs> last night I was talking <laughs> with somebody who never destroyed a character in their whole game. It was like, this was really unlucky, but yeah. Who ripped I them never up? got a chance to finish season one, but season two, uh, you know, I have no idea, but it looks really cool. And I, I do enjoy season one. Asul. I've never played Asul. It looks beautiful. Want to try that? Near and Far. So a storytelling game. Um, I'm seeing that I really enjoy the storytelling aspects in a lot of games, but I need, you know, I need something to keep me interested uh, beyond just stories. And I want to see, I want the stories to carry me through. But uh, anyhow, uh, Above and Below was not one of my favorites, but I figured I'd try Near and Far. And that's anyway, I didn't get a chance to yet. So it's not on here. Uh, Noria, did not get a chance to try that. Sunday. Altiplano. Sunday, yes, I would love to try Noria with you on Sunday. So maybe I can even update uh, the the list later on. Uh, Altiplano, Pulsar 2849, and there's a lot of other ones that could surprise me or that I've slipped my mind. Um, but I know that every game that I've played, I looked through all of my plays in 2017 and, and uh, put all the remarkable games on this list. Um, and uh, anyway, oh, Magic Maze, I suppose, is one that very well could make it. I just, I've played it like once, but I didn't feel it gave me a good, good idea for it. But it's a really cool idea. Almost has a space alert type element of where it restricts what you can do in a, in a um, cooperative game in a way that really makes it cooperative and not just, you know, a puzzle that can be alpha gamed. So um, there's a few expansions that I didn't get a chance to play. Marco Polo is one of them. Isle of Sky, Journeyman. I didn't get a chance to try that, uh, but there's many other expansions. So anyway, you won't see a lot of expansions on this list, and I never made an exhaustive list because it felt like there was just a ton of expansions that came out of Destin this year that I never got to track. Starting with the disappointments, number five, and I'm really gonna gonna I'm just gonna say what I have to say, and I and I'll give you guys a chance to comment, and then I'll go okay, to the next. Joe, one. If, if one of my games I recommended isn't on this list, I'm gonna be highly disappointed. <laughs> I think you're going to be disappointed, TC. Ah, <laughs> I didn't uh, do my job be, last year. <laughs> TC, daggers are coming, so get up your guard. But there has yeah. to be expectations for there to be a disappointment. <laughs> the best way to deal with Joe is just to have low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That, I, everybody listening. You were pretty much begging for that one, Joe. You're pretty much yeah, begging for yeah. that one. You made it better. You made it better. Before that, it was like I, I, I looked really mean, and now I just look like an idiot, which is more appropriate. So, All right. My number five disappointment is Yamatai. Uh, this game, to me, was just like a mess of a bunch of people who had to come into work, had to do something, um, wanted to make another five tribes, but didn't really have a good uh, engine to build off of like they did with Mancala. Um, in five tribes, and instead we ended up with an uninspired Euro sandbox with ridiculous superpowers and a draggy board development. There's a bunch of cool ideas that were poorly executed and mashed together, but it's pretty in that five tribes way. Ah, from Days of Wonder. Is that the Days of Wonder game? Yes, it is. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it is. And by Bruno Cathala. Okay, I'm just filling in the gaps here. Okay, cool. <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, and I'll, I'll give you it. So uh, uh, my next one, disappointment number four. Is called Outlive. Um, it was a Kickstarter. And uh, anyway, I really wanted to like Outlive. I did. Um, I mean, it was elegant, had a tight pseudo rondel, but it had this sort of a turd mixed into its whole formula in the form of a building process that involved horribly efficient rooms. When I'm getting more rewarded by gaming the system and getting all my stuff late game uh, to avoid ca it causing leaks from the beginning, I'm a little disappointed by that. A game where more workers is less efficient could sound cool on paper, but in practice, doing less stuff isn't very entertaining. Wow, never heard of this one. Nope, me either. It's by Gre I, Gregor, Gregory Oliver. Don't recognize the designer. I, yeah. I did want to say agreed with you largely on Yamatai. It's like, okay. it's like Yamatai is like f f five trides is bad cousin. <laughs> and and I liked Five Tribes reasonably well, but Yamatai was just like no. So I just yeah, wanted to I, I couldn't get, up there. I couldn't find anything to really like like about it. It was just very, very much a disappointment. So uh, that's disappointment number five. Yamatai disappointment number four outlive. Now on to number three. Ethnos. This has been actually making a lot of people's like top list of the year that I've been following. And uh my, my comments on it are, it's top deck hero, the board game. All mm -hmm. good fun, 
while there are cards to actually draft, which happens only at the beginning of the game and when players have already drawn poorly. Waiting for opponent's misfortune to have any real choices feels awful. I love how many directions the system is explored with in the variable races. It's like, But it's like planning a five-course meal around a box of chicken McNuggets. It's got minotaurs. I, <laughs> it's, I, it's, I actually like the minotaurs. I like all the races. Uh-huh. I, I I really like Radis. This felt to me like Radis, except, hey, let's introduce a bunch of top decking to Radis. Uh, and... Yeah, that actually is a really yeah. good point, because Radis has a very similar sort of like um, area control aspect, aspect to it. But I, just, I see no reason to own this in a world where Radis exists, so I'll leave there, it at of, of the cards drawn in the game, I feel like so many of them are just right off the top of the deck. Yeah, it and it's is. it's like it's... I get one card, and you're wanting to get the same color or the same uh, you know, race, the same fantasy race. And if that doesn't happen, you're just like, oh, now I have to make a decision. And my decision is going to invariably end up with making things available to my opponents. So it's yeah. like damned if I do, damned if I don't. That either, to me. Yeah, you either top deck what you want and you win, or you don't top deck what you want and you hope your opponents win. Absolutely, yeah. That's the whole game, and it's, yeah, no. no. It's a cool mini or not game. You think they're just riding the wave on that one? Um, uh, with, I don't know, man. I think, I honestly uh, think, it's Paolo Mori, who I think, mm-hmm. you know, is, is a designer with some credit behind them. I just think that it's, it's a really well-designed game with a core gameplay flaw that involves just too much drawing off the top of the deck and it makes me not even care and not want to sit there and wait to see how it all plays out you end up like shuffling the deck like three times and playing through three rounds and at the start of the round there's like eight cards available and then they just dry up and it gets to where there's nothing just oh, okay nothing. <laughs> and it's just, yeah and it's just like on my turn i draw a card off the top of the deck mm. and that happens so so much unacceptable so like I gotta point out. So far, your lists have been—you've named two games that like are just paler versions of other games, in my opinion. So I'm with you yeah. so far. Okay, I haven't even oh, heard see, of them. I, so. I think I don't know how this next one will go, but uh, my disappointment number two is Century Spice Road. Oh my word! I can agree with you on this one. <laughs> so, okay, it's it, to me any interesting hand building in this game, which it does have a pretty cool like hand management picking it up system. It's quickly ferried away by a drafting line that calls to mind my frustrations with Ascension-style deck builders. It's it's one of those games I just have no interest in ever playing again. I feel like I'm being very negative, but I'm with you so far. Color cube conversion is what it ended up being for me. I'm like, I turn this cube to this, this, that, that, and I cash them in for victory points. I get this coin if there happens to be one. Oh, you didn't put the coins in the right spot. Okay, we got to go there. And then, okay, wow. (laughs) It's the engine that you're building seems cool, but the way that you're getting these cards is just like from this random row. So I can't even really invest in the system that you're talking about there, TC. Because it's like anything I pick up, and some of these cards are like objectively worse or better than other cards. You know, you have cards that have like identical functions but different costs, as I recall. And I, I really like I that really irks me when that type of stuff. Well, happens. not only that, but you have to like if you see a card you want you know, that's going to be good, I think you have to like pay more for it and like leave a trail of spice or something, be able to pick it up. Yeah, yeah. If you have the cubes, yeah, have I the mean, cubes, and if not, you know, it's going to get picked up, and yeah. Mm-hmm. It's it's it was a it's 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 a filler game that if I never see again I'm fine with. Even when yeah. they rethemed it to like Gollum Spice Road, I'm like, eh, okay. I, would, fulfilled, I don't know. I for me, it fulfilled it and scratched the same exact itch that Splendor scratches, <laughs> which is a game that you hate and never yeah. want to play again. Yeah, you want to guess what what itch that is that I'm scratching when I'm thinking of either game? Scabies. <laughs> <laughs> It could be, yeah. I mean, I know that it's really hit hard for a lot of people. I saw a really weird, what I thought a bizarre evaluation where somebody was describing Century Spice Road versus Splendor, and they were like, all right, well, Century Spice Road's kind of like a heavier game than Splendor. And I was just like, no, no, it's not. Absolutely not. So I don't know. I, I, I shouted at my TV then. Yeah. But anyway, I didn't think Joe's it was side at home, Joe sat at home shaking his fist and shouting. <laughs> yeah, and, and just think it's the first of a trilogy so we got more to look forward to Joe 
It's gonna be great. You know <laughs> There's what? Even it, more. Yeah. They might they might find they might fix it for me. I don't know. I mean, it, you know, of course, the first thing they'll have to tell me to make me think they won't is you can reuse your play mat. You know, <laughs> because that's my main issue with the game. So, but that's uh, disappointment number two for me. Century Spice Road. And then my disappointment number one, I said a little bit more uh, about this one than I did in the others because I honestly feel like I had very, very high expectations for this game. Very, very high. And it really fell flat. And I think that it's probably just more of a it's not for me, but it's really, really not for me. And my frustrations with it, like, I, I they, they caused me to put it at number one here. Um, and that game is Keeper. That's K E Y P E R. That's not what um, I expected. Okay, all right. Keeper. No, no, I, it's not. It's like a flower game or something. Not, that was not the game I expected you to say. It's not Time of Crisis. It really is That's not. That's what and I thought you were like, going to say. It's not Time of Crisis because you know what? Like to me, I knew going into Time of Crisis, like people warned me about like the dice combat, like everything about it that people told me to sell it to me. It was like you know, well, I like this aspect to it, but you know, it does have dice combat. I just know that, and it's like. Okay, well, you know, fine. I think, yeah, I, I didn't think it'd be number one simply because you said, I think I remember you saying Time of Crisis was 90% a good game. Yes. <laughs> I think it's what yes, you said, but or something is, though, like that. Honestly, that 90% of a good game is something where I just need to play it and play it and play it, and I think that my my frustrations might, like I might see that the, the dice combat is not quite as bad. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, the events and stuff still frustrate me, but like, no, I did not... I didn't think of it as like this huge disappointment. As a matter of fact, it's a game that I still play, and I could see, I could not see myself playing Keeper probably ever again. Tell um, me about Keeper. You know. Is it a key flower game? What what is this? Come on, I want to okay. hear. Want to well, hear? The thing is, Keeper Keeper is a game that has a lot of buzzwords that sound great on paper. It has it's a worker placement game where your workers are all unique. Um, they all have their different colors. Um, and in in the version I got, I got the Meeple version, which was. A, a dime, it was a pretty penny, um, but they're actually like painted miniature, you not painted miniatures, but painted meeples from Meeple Source. Anyhow, uh, so it's got individual workers uh, that are all, you know, different. When you place them on specific areas, you get a bonus if they're the right color and matches the color of the place. It has uh, boards that are like from some, I, I think it's like a kid's company. It's like Jacob's Ladders where you can like fold them and just, you can just kind of keep folding them in like a circular like where you, you fold them and then you can fold them from there and fold them from there and fold them from there. And you just kind of keep folding them until you're back where you started without ever going backwards. I don't know if that makes any sense, but it's like it has folds in that in a half. You know, there's like 16 squares, 16 uh, little hexes. So it's a four by four grid. And each one of them can kind of bend in different directions. It's, it's a really interesting um, looking, you know, piece. But they're like four of them included in the game, and each player is going to place one out. And honestly, I didn't even feel like they were very different from one another. Honest, as a matter of fact, several times we would end up with two literally identical boards on on the table at the same time, and that happened in like every single round. Um, what you're actually doing is you're building tiles and acquiring tiles, all from like I said, simple, fairly simple worker placement. It has like a I place a worker, and then you follow me. And I just absolutely thought that was frustrating. It almost sort of like just led people to just be like, sure, I'll follow you. Sure, I'll follow you. Because once all your workers are placed, now you can do this awesome thing and lay them down. And now you get like stronger actions. It just seemed like a game where you just like get lots and lots and lots and lots of crap. And then it's like later on, you're trying to figure out how to use it. But it's like you got so much crap and the game just showers you with crap. It, 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 well, let's play like this. It, it feels like it has no difficulty uh, difference. Let, let me just read what I've got here because I feel like I'm, I've hit some of the points. All right, so I, I usually ignore the term soulless euro, but Keeper has me wanting to grab for that low-hanging fruit. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's J-A-S. It's just another soulless euro. It's Jace, J-A-S-E. There you go. There's a – there's a, for you. <laughs> I usually balk at that term. I usually am like, eh, you know, people – that's people telling me they don't like euros, right? Yeah. But this one really makes me makes me reach for that. And it's specifically because everything you do for points in this game has an arbitrary and painfully constricting limit attached to it. The gimmick, uh, th that what I mean by that is every tile that you're going to build is like identical to every other tile that's similar to it. Like there's eight there's eight types of animals in the game and really their only difference is that you can only collect like four of each type. 
and you got to move on to something else. And and the only way you get them is like just by going on a spot on the board. It just matters what spots on the board. They are functionally identical. Anyway, um, that that first of all, I felt like there was a lot of you know just fluff that didn't matter. Um, the, there are gimmicky flip boards that offer little variants, some being literally identical. Worker placement has a following system that encourages banking tons of resources. So who cares? You'll probably need them later, and getting done early lets you start working laying down workers for even more resources. What do you know? It results in swings from having nothing to be swimming in what you lacked. And almost everything in this game has four identically functioning, identically functioning equivalents whose only difference is cosmetic. That system can work with equivalent resources, but when it's present in so many systems, I'm talking building resources, basic animals and advanced animals and gems, it becomes meaningless. It's like the Stone Age of medium heavy, medium euros, not even heavy really. Only even Stone Age made the resources worth different values. So it's weird when a game has me comparing it to Stone Age, and Stone Age is favorable. There are a few glimmers of light here, so you know it's not entirely darkness. The claiming worker placement area, so you actually have to claim the areas that people put their workers on uh, to get the workers, is a pretty cool concept because that's what you get for your workers in the next round. Um, but when the boards differed only slightly, it really offered decisions. It was just like, I'm going to go to a place on my board because my board has basically all the stuff that your board has. So I don't really care about going to your board or my board. I'll always go to my board because I get those dudes back. The biggest positive with this game is that when I opened it, it smelled better than any other board game I've ever smelled in my life. <laughs> it was This game is aromatic to a fault. It smells beautiful. It's like they use like especially infused paint. Hmm. Anybody? Keeper? Well, um... <laughs> I yeah I know a lot of people who like the 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 other titles in this series. That's kind of unusual. Um, I have no desire to play it now. But <laughs> well, no, no, no. Don't let me shoot it. I'd be interested to see what you're saying. You know, like that's my hey. reaction to it. Well, I, have you played any other Keyflower games? I've played Keyflower um a lot. Yeah. I've played Key and... to the City London, which, believe it or not, I'm one of the few in the camp that's like. Key to the City London kind of cleaned up Keyflower for me, and oh, I'd rather okay. play it than Keyflower, but nope. I feel like I'm in a very small no. <laughs> group there. Yeah, it sounds like you are in a small group. <laughs> I played, The only one I played was the London one. Yeah? And that was, it's, that was... it's fine. It's just it's 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 like it's like Keyflower's like embarrassing cousin and drunk at the party. <laughs> I know it sounds like Keeper might it might be that one. No, yeah, I don't think Keeper ironically Keeper didn't even is not... get invited to the party. <laughs> oh, yeah, just, like, <laughs> just leave him at the door. Ironically, it's not a it's not a keeper for okay, me. Okay. So uh, that's my five disappointments, and uh, now we move on to the good stuff. All the, right. The tier five is where I started this. So I started <sighs> um, at like a, a level of where these are 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 games that I would consider as like good, borderline great games. Um, each of them seems to have an element that keeps me from really like desiring them for me. But I feel like these are great games that I would play with other folks or, or play in the right circumstances. Starting off with The Rur, A Story of Coal Trade. I specifically love the advancements that were made in this game for uh, the expansion, The Ohio. Um, when I've played this, it's it the game has definitely gone on longer than... I wanted it to go on, and certainly longer than some of the other players that I've played this with wanted it to go on. However, with the Ohio, I think that things were largely cleaned up, and things work really smoothly. And the the Ruhr is one where I feel like if I could play it five or six times with the same group, we'd get to this point where we didn't have to, like, things just happened. Um, the things that were automatic would happen automatically. when pe you know People would just know it was the right move. I feel like it's always slowed down in every game I've played, and that's kind of dinged my personal opinion of it. But I really do appreciate the Ruhr, the, uh, the Ohio's side, and see that as being like the ideal way to experience an excellent board game, the Ruhr, A Story of Coal Trade. Oh, so you see, this game has a bunch of dice. Well, yeah, this is one of the... Um, that's. Um... Oh god, I can't think of the company. It's on the tip of my tongue. Um, Capstone. Yeah, thank you. you. Yeah, that's it's one of the games that they published that I've, I've wanted to try. Um, I think the difficulty for me is just finding hey. a group that wants to play it because it I want to play it like multiple times. 
Yeah, I would recommend that. TC, I have I have more news for you though. There are, the dice in this game literally never get rolled. Oh, that's sad. Those are some uh, neglected <laughs> dice. I need some love. <laughs> Trent, have you had a chance to try this one? Uh, no. I have not. All right, moving on to one I believe you have. Uh, another one from Tier 5 here, Anachrony. Uh, this has really moved up in the Board Game Geek charts. Uh, very, very highly rated by the community. And for me, Anachrony is a really cool overarching concept. Um, it's fairly standard worker placement to its own detriment. Other game systems tend to impress me more sporadically. And the world creation built around a cataclysmic impact raises it up a notch for me. Overall, uh, the fact that the workers do have different uses in different places, but it's kept to a really concise amount, um, calls to mind Tricarion. Um, but honestly, I would put Tricarion over Anachrony. That's one of the things I think it's in such a low tier, considering, because I do like Anachrony quite a bit. Um, but some of its expansion elements that it added were kind of hit and miss for me. Some of them I'd always play with, other ones I don't ever want to play with again. Um, and just overall, though, it, it was a cool system that I feel like is largely overblown, especially with the gigantic miniatures that are, you know, like the game itself is, in my opinion, not exactly huge like those miniatures, um, but it is definitely a really cool game system um, and one that stands in a little bit of the shadow of what I thought was one of the most beautiful games of all time uh, that I've played, Tricarion, and that is Anachrony. Tricarion is like one of my favorite Euro games ever. I mean, when that game came out, we played it out. I was stunned. I uh, loved it. I loved the the little puzzle you made on those cards. And Anachrony has been interesting to watch because when it came out, it was like it peaked and people were like, oh, it's not that good. And it kind of slid down and now it's coming back up. And so I'm hoping that I'll get a chance to actually play this one because my it's just, my love for Tricarion is, makes me want to play this one. Mm-hmm. I liked it. I played it with you, so I, you know that I've played it. Um, yeah. I liked it perfectly well. The miniatures are almost comically overdone. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> They're just like gigantic and chunky and almost completely unnecessary. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that's why that's why you have a Kickstarter game, right? <laughs> yeah. It's it's, they're giant. <laughs> but I enjoyed the game. It's a good it's a good solid game. I would never turn down a game of Tricarian. Well, I'm glad no, to hear um, you guys. I, I would turn out one of Tricarian, but Anachrony either. Uh, anachrony, <laughs> yeah, Anachrony. Too late at night, blah. Hey, uh, anachrony so is what I was talking about. Um, it's better than Splendor. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> whoa. <laughs> so we got, we've got, we've got. Uh, so we've, let me our progression. We've got Century Spice Road, then we've got Splendor, and we got Anachrony. No. Now, what's Anach this? Anachrony is actually a good game. I would happily <laughs> play Anachrony any time. Yeah, is it, yeah. The, those ones are yeah, steaming piles that Trent would never play. I'm not saying that I feel that way about Splendor, but I definitely like, you know, I definitely get your sentiment there, Trent. So get what you're saying. Well, I'm uh, really glad on. to hear you talk about this one because um, it, it makes me want to go out and play it. As, as I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm uh, relieved to hear it. It gets me excited again. <laughs> Certainly. Well, this next one seems like it's, it's a game that's specifically made uh, to treat dice well. That's called Dice Forge. It's another game in my tier five still. So Anachrony, the Ruhr, Dice Forge, all in tier five. Uh, you know that cool feeling that you get at the start of every turn in Catan when those dice are rolled and you're like, ooh, what did I get? And then most of the time it's like, you didn't get anything. Yeah, in Dice Forge, everybody on everybody, every other player on your turn and you on every other player's turn gets to roll your own personal dice that you have been crafting throughout the game with these really cool... Uh, removable faces that go on um, the actual, to, actually they're like uh, like screen printed, some sort of screen printing technique that makes these dice actually work. Um, these dice faces where you can pull them off and they don't really rub off easy. Anytime, uh, the, anyway, the dice are going to give you things like income or there's like three different types of income. So you're basically just getting three different types of income to buy things and then buy these cards that'll give you points or let you get a special ability that lets you, you know, buy things easier. It's a pretty simple system. Um, it has a little bit of that feeling like Mystic Veil, except unlike Mystic Veil, I found this very interesting. I was very disappointed by Mystic Veil. I felt like its game systems were super tacked on. Here in Dice Wars, everything feels tied to like, you know, the idea of like, I rolled, what do I get? It's a really cool, like, 
to me an exploration and it taps into that sort of Catan, um, like, you know, something that I remember enjoying because Catan was my gateway into the hobby and Dice Forge really gets at that. And it has just beautiful production, totally auxiliary. Um, but, you know, when you're getting to modify your own dice and roll them this much, it's it's really just a sweet thing to see happen. Uh, yeah, this one I've played once. It, I agree. It's got a beautiful production values. I mean, it's it's fairly stunning. Um, however, the one time I did play it, I went to go change the die face out, and it shot across the coffee shop, and I spent like 20 minutes trying to find it. <laughs> 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 so that was, that was so, uh, you know, because it comes with a little tool to use. I was like, okay, I'll just, pshoo, and the thing just flew like halfway across <laughs> the top. I'm like, oh crap, guys, I got to go find this thing. So I like, the game came to a screeching halt because of me. But it's, uh, I will agree, it is better than Mystic Veil. Vale, but it's just, I don't know, there was just something about it that it's one of those games I wouldn't mind playing again. I wouldn't, I'd like to play it a bit more to see what it holds, but it's not something I personally would invest in. Mm -hmm. That was my take on it. But I do agree. Production values are stellar on this thing. <laughs> nice Forge, I've had it. It's actually hit with my family. My kid, my oldest son particularly really, 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 really liked it. Have you had um, any problems with flying dice faces like I did? Yeah, they're they're hard to get on and off. I don't know how else you do it without making them so that the dice faces just fall off. You want them to be on firmly when you're playing it, and thus inherently they're going to be difficult to take off. Or if they were easy to take off, they wouldn't stand firmly mm -hmm. while playing. I think it's like you have to do it that way. But yes, there have been dice faces flying all over the house. <laughs> um, I haven't lost any, so that's good. And mm -hmm. it is a heck of a lot better than the other dice forging game, which was Rattle Bones. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I, I heard yeah, there's a rolling mode. Yeah, so. That's, yeah, I, I've heard that one was a steaming pile. This one is definitely interesting, but it feels like, uh, yeah, it feels a lot like Mystic Veil. Vale. So, you know, if you if you thought Mystic Veil vale was cool, check this one out for sure. I think it's better. I would rather play it. Um, you know, it's got a lot of really ingenious pieces, um, especially in its production. Like, the way that it stores itself is really good, too. Uh, that was, in Tier 5, Dice Forge. Uh, another game in Tier 5. I almost feel like this is a game that almost shouldn't deserve us an entry for this year. Um, this is the last game in Tier 5, and it is Codenames Duet. Simply because making Codenames cooperative and making it work to me was absolutely amazing. I think it's the greatest game. Codenames is the greatest game whose entirety feels like an afterthought to me. But it's really a surprisingly functional and robust cooperative game. It super works well. Um, I, I really like it. You know, just puzzling over things and not having the stress of competing with another group. And, you know, not having a, a winner or loser, a, a loser to have to worry about at your table is something that I always find enjoyable and, and you know, it's, you know, it can also lead to you and your partner getting mad at each other because you're both losing together now because of how stupid they're being. Anyhow, Codenames Duet is, is also on Tier 5. I, I just love Codenames, and this is a, this is a game that uh, makes it work for cooperative play. I found that Codenames Duet was fairly hard. Mm -hmm. I feel like it is harder than normal Codenames because... You've really got to be in good sync with the person you're playing with, or it doesn't go real well. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, you're definitely doing... I mean, it's constant engagement. I think it's another thing that I like about it, is that it's like you're constantly either thinking about what, you know, giving a clue, or you're, you know, chewing on the actual clue that you've already been given. So, I mean, there's no... Like, there's even less downtime here, because you're playing both parts. Maybe that's why I like it, but I, I agree with you, Trent, that it, it almost feels like some of the clues I'm like, uh, you know, it, it, it's tough to do both of those roles at one time. You know, I feel like I kind of almost lose sight of my own board while I'm considering the clues that I'm getting. So it's difficult, but I think that I admire the challenge, but I totally agree with you. Haven't played it, but I will give you this though. Uh, Vladl Shabatl is a designer. You should always keep your eye on what this guy comes up with is something else sometimes. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And here's another designer to always keep your eye on, at least now again, you know, you, 20 years ago, it was always keep your eye on now, not so much, but I'm going to have to keep my eye on Reiner Knizia uh, because he made an excellent game and it's actually in a higher tier, uh, tier four, counting my way down to tier one. In tier four, we've got the quest for El Dorado. 
It is a what I would choose as a deck building entry point. It's the perfect gateway deck builder. I love Dominion, but it can be tough for a first deck building game, given that progress is obscured in the deck that you build. You can't see your cards in there. Also, raising the bar for entry is the ever-changing card offering, which frequently features cards with obtuse effects that perplex new players. I'm still referring to Dominion. Eldorado's smaller card draw and linear board helps players see where they are and what they need their deck to give them to progress. Other deck builders have tried to be on new players' levels by shuffling all the cards you can buy and making the offering random. Random isn't inherently easier or harder. It's just random. The only randomness in Eldorado is your card draw. The linear path occasionally branches and frequently puts players in each other's way. The potential setups offer a sort of designer sandbox. I never would have imagined this would be the way Kinesia would recapture my attention, but I'm happy he's back. Yeah, I this every time I, I I notice now every time I pass this on the rental shelf, it's got that big gold mask that just stares at me and says, "You need to take me home with you," and it just stares at me the whole night. But yeah, the, the more you talk about this, I think my biggest reason I never even tried it was because it's a Kinitsia game. You know, I was mm -hmm. like, "Oh, great, here's another game with just uh, some mechanics with this light, fluffy theme kind of thrown on as an afterthought." But the more, like I said, you're you're selling I me on, and one of these days I'm gonna. It's You're going to come get home the with theme me. for this, TC. I think you will actually find yourself that you'll find that this game feels fairly thematic. And I know it is. Kinesia has a couple of really thematic feeling games. And this to me would be an example of one where he really scored on that. That's not what attracts me necessarily, but it's, you know, it's something that makes it even a better gateway game. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, that's, that, I'm going to be trying out here pretty quick. And this, this one would have flown completely under the radar for me if you haven't been so persistent on it. Yeah, I have hopes for Kinesia as of late, given this and the game that I'm very tempted to hype. Ooh, okay. Ooh. <laughs> Preview. <laughs> yeah, yeah, spoiler alert. Next up on my list, still in Tier 4. Uh, we're in Tier 4 here, working our way up. Mythic Battles Pantheon. It is an elegant deck management system, and it meets a robustly equipped, simple miniatures battle game. Myths are integrated seamlessly into the design. Though it relies on D6s for combat, the ability to use non-misses to boost other dice values raises Mythic Battles Pantheon above most dice chuckers. It would be much higher if this was my cup of tea. So, you know, take it for what it is. It is excellent at what it's going for. It succeeds on every level. If it was more for me, it would probably be edging other folks out of, out of uh, their potential customer base. Mythic Battles. Okay, I'll have to keep an eye on it. <laughs> I saw you playing it once. We're good. Yeah, I would say that the the only thing, um, we tried playing a cooperative. There's so many scenarios. There's a ton of scenarios for this game. Um, and they're, like there's like 15 of them printed in the book. And there's even a mini campaign. Um, and with expansions, you can get more campaigns. Uh, we tried a cooperative scenario, and it really felt, I don't know, like um, it, it was an interesting exploration, but it took out a lot of what I loved about the game to make it cooperative and to somehow make it work. So, you know, it, it, I think it's really best as that tabletop skirmish miniatures battle game. It's going to be easy to teach, but it has this, like I said, an elegant, simple deck management system that I really loved. Uh, still in Tier 4, I already reviewed it, so I'm not going to go in-depth. This War of Mine, the board game. It's, uh, yeah, like I said, I've already reviewed it. I got all this right up, and I'm just going to skip over it. So, anyhow, that's still in Tier 4, this War of Mine, the board game. Moving on up, another one in Tier 4 is, and this one I had a really, really hard time placing on the list at all, because, like, just the style of game is difficult to call a top game of all time because it doesn't last all time. The This is uh, Unlock the Escape Adventures, so the, the Unlock system of escape room-style games is what I'm putting on here. Uh, they are one-shot games. They're, like I said, really tough to put on here. However, Unlock has a great tutorial to get you set up, it uses its features to take you places a real escape room wouldn't dare. Uh, my favorites are the cartoon world of Squeak and Sausage and the underwater wreckage of the Nautilus Traps among its different places that it takes you. So it really does bust out of just an escape room. I feel like Exit is probably the best one to go to if you're primarily playing for the puzzles. Um, and, you know, like, for me, I like the puzzles, but I really like the environment that it's able to create and unlock, and I don't feel that quite as much in a, in in the um, exit games. I feel like Deckscape was kind of a weird mix of them both, but it was very simple in its design. Like, had a very simple... Anyhow, I put Unlock on here. I would say Deckscape 
comes really close to unlock. Um, and I like Exit as well for a lot, for kind of a different reason, because uh, I love those puzzles. But anyway, this is, you know, think of this as like escape room games are an excellent game system that I'm going to keep playing. And I enjoy quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking forward to trying some of those unlocked ones, but I think uh, uh, Exit's going to trump it because it's got the Pharaoh's tomb. <laughs> Ooh, well, they might. Chris is uh, still looking for that one. Yeah, well, if you get the secret island of Doctor Gorse, it it does. I think you'll at least find it's got a pyramid. Okay, hey, Carissa. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's. I I think you'd like that one. It's tough though. It's hard. It's real, real hard. And you're supposed to play in like two separate groups. I would not recommend it for your first game. Okay. Okay. Um, moving on up. Still in tier four here. Uh, I'm going to talk about Fog of Love. I feel like my tier four was like almost like story-driven games specifically. Like, you know, the games that are excellent games that aren't ones I would normally be be putting on my top ten list, you know. I'm, I feel like I'm always looking for this sort of perfect strategic experience. But, you know, these games are really challenging me, and I love them. And like I said, they are remarkable games that I absolutely love playing, love the experience I get from them. So I need a whole separate category for Fog of Love. It excels so much at what it does. And what it does is so different than anything else on the market. It's seen my wife, a non-gamer, go as far as to role play. It's inspired me to reflect on relationships in general. It makes semi-co-op actually work for me, which I previously thought impossible. It's mechanically solid, where the real skill is in not only reading your partner, but also choosing between her or him, yourself, and your future together. I think we should play this together. <laughs> so, that's so so creepy. It would be so weird. So Joe. weird. Yeah. And we'll record it. I just don't know. Okay. Well, that's Fog of Love. It it is one like, you know, it's one that my wife just totally loves. Moving up, we are now moving to the next tier that is in tier three. Um, we're starting to really get into the meat of like, you know, these games are close to my heart. Um, in putting these tiers, I tried to sort of make it, you know, the at the top of the list is almost like my favorite style of game, and thus I love those ones more, and I see those as more of an accomplishment just by virtue of how much design and effort put, is put into them. Here we're at Tier 3, where these are like games that I'm like, you know, as soon as I say the name of them, I'm like, ooh, everything starts swimming through my head about the, the interesting decisions I make. And the first one is Mini Rails, a great entry point for stock-based games and for route building or Cube Rails style games as well. I love the variable setup and the emphasis on turn order manipulation. Maybe had King Domino tried two pieces instead of one outside of its two-player game, like Mini Rails does for how it works with you choosing uh, two different actions, maybe King Domino would have actually worked for me. Um, anyway, it's not that I hate it, but you know, it's not showing up on this list. Mini Rails, though, you know, really excellent entry point um, for, for stock-based games. You never have to really do any math. For even though it includes stock, that's that's something really special, and that's mini rails. Have you played this one, Trent? Yes, um, I was actually I think believe the, I was the one that taught it to Joe. So, yeah, yeah I've, I've only played Trent's copy. Oh, okay. It, it's it's I really really like it. It's a fantastic light rails game. I mean that's what it is. It's it takes a lot of the essence of what you might like about a rails game and boils it down to like twenty minutes. I I'm really impressed with it. Next up will be still in tier three. Caverna Cave versus Cave. Now you will see no Caverna, no base game Caverna on any list that I've ever made, except for maybe disappointments or games that shouldn't exist in my humble opinion. However, Caverna Cave versus Cave fixes the tension destroying adventure system of Caverna, instead supplanting it with player driven tableau building. The system is tightened without ever penalizing players. A complete game as well, Unlike Agricola, all creatures big and small. That's the two-player version of Agricola that I like quite a bit, but needs an expansion. Um, and Caverna Cave versus Cave, though it is complete as a, as a game itself, I would love to see some expansions for it. Yeah, I like this one quite a bit. Um, I've, me and uh, me and Carissa played this one, and I like the the rotating the the caves and trying to fit things in and. Um, the track order you got to pick the tiles on it. It it was it was it was it was good. I was I was pleasantly surprised with this one. And Trent, 
<laughs> Trent doesn't care. <laughs> Pass. Pass. Uh, I li- okay, I liked it, and I think that it should never have been called anything associated with Caverna because it feels nothing like Caverna. <laughs> yeah, okay. That one, that's, that's, isn't that the truth? Yeah. Like, Caverna mean, was a one where it's just like it was just like a spread of everything, and he was like, "Oh, you can't take that. I'll take that. Take that. Take that." I mean, seriously, it's almost like I like it less because it says Caverna on the box. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not the, but that big piece of tape over it. It's a uh, a game of caves <laughs> yeah i mean i i did i did enjoy it, it was a it's a good two-player game but man i don't know what it has nothing to do with caverna it was obviously named that just try to sell it i guess <laughs> mm-hmm. well then moving up here still in tier three i'm still counting up our way to tier number one with my favorite games of 2017 i'm at rajas of the ganges rajas of the ganges rises above simple worker placement Due to cool combos, well-managed dice res- as a resource, and a touch of private network building. It even comes with some small expansions that I'm yet to try. Side note, um, and this is kind of separate. I don't feel like I can really give this game specific points, but man, once this game is set up, the time spent resetting between rounds is like nothing. Like It just feels like a real race for the finish without anything to pull you from the experience. You're... You know, everything that you're doing in this game is trying to get the amount of income and money that you have, which you're going to be spending, to meet kind of like your overall points, which scores, you know, every two bucks is essentially worth a point when you think of it that way. Um, But you're trying to get these two markers to meet, and the game just ends. And it is, it has, for that reason, it can feel like kind of like an anticlimactic finish where you're just like, oh, well, the game's over. Can I do anything? Nope. Okay. Good game. You know, you don't get to like pull off your last combo that you've been planning for a few turns, which can be a little bit frustrating. And I know that very disheartening. Um, but it it is just like a really easy and simple to use system that has those cool combos. But I was able to teach it to my wife, and she truly enjoyed it. So you know, kind of like one of those weird games where everything in it just makes sense. It's very intuitive, very easy once it gets set up to keep playing. And then I really enjoy it, and that's why it's in my tier three. So you know, we're talking nine through twelve if you want to number things on my my board game uh, top board games of the year. Hmm. I haven't even heard of this one. That's I'll have to look at this one. I don't know how much. Trent, I know you it. played it. I don't. I I like it. Um, I think it needs more replays. Uh, I like the dual track system. I thought that mm-hmm. was very clever. I like the way that it worked. Um, it did feel a little engine building and en- engine building to me a little bit, and that mm-hmm. it felt like the game started accelerating after a while. Oh, like sure. at first you're kind of inching along on both tracks, and then all of a sudden you're going zoom. Yep. Oh, yeah. I had one turn where I made, like, the equivalent of $27, like, all in one action. It was, like, I made, like, 12 points and 3 bucks or 5 bucks, whatever. And it was, like, you know, every other play at the table was, like, I I can't. I can't do anything like that. So, (laughs) it was cool. Caroline beat me in our first game, though. So, you know, and I was not, like, I was not putting on the gloves or anything. It was uh, it was a good game, and that to me says there's something really special and, and very intuitive about the design because it, it kept me entertained while still, you know, offering her some, you know, a system that she could grasp. So, that's Tier 3, and that's, uh, there's one more actually left in Tier 3. So, I guess it's my games 8 through 12. And the last game in Tier 3 is Sagrada. Sagrada Ooh. is a beautiful dice drafting system like a simplified Grand Austria hotel with variable setups and a scoring a la Kingdom Builder. The specific tools and scoring cards are a bit samey because all those things I just mentioned, if you know how much I love, like those, those, that's the laundry list of all the perfect things for me. You know, like, uh, si- like it, variable setups and scoring and dice, dice drafting, kind of like Grand Austria Hotel is really cool. Um, but you know, all in all, the whole package works for a great thinky gateway with beautiful art. Well, I've I've heard really mixed things on this one. There's some people that I game with who absolutely loathe this game, and there's people who I game with who absolutely love it. And I have not had a chance to try it, but man, all those dice, I really want to. I really want to play this game. It's just way too many dice for me to not get my hands on this thing. <laughs> Trent, have you had a chance to play Sagrada? Nope, I haven't played it. Okay. On to Tier 2 now. We are into the first games in Tier 2. Tier 2 is actually pretty small. <laughs> I think it's only it's only three games. Um, oh, so sad. Yeah. Uh, but we're at Tier 2 now, on our way up to 1. 
And my tier two starts off with a game I had very, very low expectations for, but holy crap. Pandemic Rising Tide. It Booyah. is oh, the previous Pandemic Iberia, which would be the last sort of like heritage pandemic game where it's kind of set in a specific time period with specific, uh, you know, like in a specific geographic location, in this case, the Netherlands. Um, the previous Pandemic Iberia was like a Pandemic 1.5. It had a new board and a few new mechanics. However, Rising Tide burst through any expectations I had by having central mechanics that behave different than pandemic diseases, but behave just as dangerous. Water behaves like you imagine it would, flowing from its entry points and fanning out to unblocked territories. And the real challenge is that while water is the antagonist, you benefit by having a manageable amount on the board for many of your included roles and your ability to pump water. You can never let those pumps run dry. Here, you're doing more constructing the infrastructure necessary to manage water than just pumping it out. You're going to build engines and run it every turn. The engine you'll build is unheard of in my pandemic experience. I had no idea that a system like pandemic could be applied to other forces of nature in such an interesting way. And add to that a totally new variable objective system, which immediately creates a mountain of replayability. And I'm sold. This is in my tier two. This is in like, you know... My top, my, my games would be numbers five through seven. You know, it, it's just absolutely amazing. Loved Pandemic Rising Tide. Could not believe how well it, it made water behave in this game. I, you know, check this one out. Seriously. Even if you're not a Pandemic fan, I still say try this. Huh. Okay. I'm going to try it. Uh, it's, I haven't, it, it's, this just recently came out like a, yeah, uh, yeah. I've only I got have a couple like, of plays in of it. Yeah, and it, it really is my latest addition to the list. I had the list all ready to go, had everything in order, and then I added Pandemic Rising Tide after I got two plays in of it, and I just want to keep trying it, man. There is, very, I'm saying, like I said, variable objectives. Like, you can cure the four diseases, which in this game are actually hydraulic projects that all have different effects when you beat them, when you finally complete them. Or you can focus on any of, there's eight more objectives. You can shuffle this deck of 12 objectives play with a totally different game you know the, the game is the same but your goals are different mm. it's just beautiful you know you still have the same replayability you'd expect from other pandemic games but to me this just this is up a notch totally up a notch okay one of my gamers is a huge pandemic fan and as i'm sure this is gonna i'm sure i'm gonna be seeing this sooner or later because i've he, he he loves pandemics i'm gonna i'm gonna push this on him be like go get this thing i want to try it <laughs> Best pandemic, period. Also, if your friend is expecting this to work like ordinary pandemic, play it on easy with them because you won't do it right. Okay, it'll, it'll no. surprise them. Okay, no, I'll have uh, a check. Okay, I'll be sure. I'll I'll be sure. Oh, we were literally... we play pandemic really well. We could play this on hard. No, 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 Mike. No, I've heard we need to we need to scale this back a bit. So to to tell you, TC, um, like this game was so ridiculous. Like one of the cards, so you know how pandemic has events. One mm -hmm. of the cards in this game is the little Dutch boy. Yes. Yes. Exactly <laughs> what you're thinking. Where he sticks his... <laughs> yep. yep. That was an event. And here's what happened. We were, we had the, the, the win of the game. We had it all mapped out. Right. And we were barely going to make it. We only had like three cards left in the player deck. We were barely going to get there, but we were going to win. And we, there was, a chance oh no there was there was eight cards left in the player deck but if it went all the way around we were going to lose that's how it went so we had to win now there was a, a one in four chance that we were going to draw one of the epidemic cards which is not an epidemic in this game it's called a storm and they happen yeah. more frequently and they actually raise the level of the sea which is just totally different anyway so first card that this guy draws for his two card draw is the little dutch boy and we're all like oh great we're basically going to win now next card he draws is the storm the last storm <laughs> and the highest storm our sea levels rose to four cubes, which spills out across the board. We were literally two water cubes away from being able to put all the water on the board and be okay. But with what we ran out of water, we ended up losing the game. It was, it was just like we were that close to the finish line. Literally, the last thing that happened, because on the next turn, first action would have been, boom, build the last hydraulic pump, game over. We win. Okay. It's I mean... just so epic, man. Such an epic conclusion. The little Dutch boy drowned <laughs> well i'm looking so, forward to this one okay yep 
that's uh, uh, that's my first one in tier two, man. And really, like 2017, what a what an amazing year. So many hard hitters. A lot of them happened right at the end of the year, but it, a lot of them were wrapped around the beginning and the end of the year. We had kind of a lull there through the summer, but man, uh, next up on my list. Aeon's End, War Eternal. Uh, still in tier two. Well, basically, my my thing for this is simple. I love Dominion, and this is a feature-rich cooperative Dominion. Hmm. Aeon's End? Oh, yeah, dude. You've not okay. tried Aeon's End? No. It's like Dominion. You, you have, like, the card stacks to choose from, but you're playing against a shuffled-up enemy, and you're all cooperating. You have, like, specially, you have, like, variable player powers. Um, you never shuffle your cards. You only ever take your card deck and turn it over, like Time of Crisis. Time of Crisis, um, you never actually – you just get to pick your cards in Time of Crisis, like Rococo. But in this one, you have to actually turn it over. So the order is fixed, but you determine that order. Turn to turn. It is, hmm. It's an excellent game, TC. you got to check it out, man. Aeon's End. Very, very good. Trent, have you had any experience with it? Yep, quite like it. All right. My last one in Tier 2, Clans of Caledonia. It's like a streamlined, streamlined trade economy imagining of Terra Mystica. It gives me 80% of what I love about Terra Mystica, while the remaining 20% is a fairly benign recipe-making game that works because of the rest of its pieces. Plus, I can teach this, and people will enjoy their first game, and I will still enjoy it too because it's not that simple, unlike Terra Mystica, which you'll hear later on up the list, might not be coming out very much. Anyway, that's Clans of Caledonia, a game I really do enjoy, especially because for what you invest, you get a ton out of it, um, but it's still in Tier 2, so not quite Tier 1. Oh, okay. Any Anything, nope, Trent? I have not even um, played this one. It's it's a good Terra Mystica. It's a more economic Terra Mystica. That's okay. about all I have to say about it. Fair enough. It's also got Scottish theme that I know sells a lot of new players as well. So, finally, we're down to my top tier. Tier 1 of my top 10. And the first game on this list is Iberian Rails. This is probably the game that you'll see highest on my list. It is, you're right, sharing a spot with all these other games. So it is the highest game that you'll see on my list um, that is probably on very few, if if any other list out there. And I think that's an absolute travesty at this point. Um, it's my pick for underappreciated game of the year. It mixes cube rails with role selection, adds replayability, and creating a design space in which simple rules create an unbelievable amount of depth. Hey, when the design, when the designer said his favorite game was Rex, I am really to tear down the door to find this game now. <laughs> that's all you had to say. I you might have I to like, do more than tear down the door, man. You might have to wait for the ice bridge to cross uh, <laughs> the Bering Strait because it's fortunately over over in the uh, eastern continents. Yeah, but yeah, I liked I, it a lot, but I haven't played it enough to really make up my mind how high I would rank it. Well, Trent, I need more plays. Yeah, that's that's the solution. You know, the only the, you got a disease, you need more plays. Yep, the only cure. Night. Next up here, uh, sharing a spot with uh, Iberian Rails is Gaia Project. Gaia Project uh, Terra is Terra Mystica set in space. Uh, Terra Mystica is in my top three games. Now it's starting to look like old socks because of how <laughs> excellent Gaia Project has developed every piece present in Terra Mystica. Shipping and terraforming now matter more. The cult track has six diverse tracks. The host of rewards games are more varied due to unique favor tile upgrades. Everything I loved about Terra Mystica is here, and now it's better. Yeah, this is this is another one I really, really want to play because the first time I ever played Terra Mystica, the first thought that ran through my head was this would make a much better sci-fi game about colonizing planets. And when this, as soon as this thing was announced, I was like, oh, the only thing holding me back is the price tag on it. But I know a few people who have it, and I'm just waiting for them to open a game group up because I really want to experience this thing. Yeah, I, I completely agree. It's a better Terra Mystica. Yeah, which, Terra Mystica is one of my favorite heroes. So yeah, it is just yeah, it is a really that's a monumental statement you're making there, Trent. Few words, but they mean a lot, and I am right there with you. Uh, next up here on Tier One as well is Spirit Island. It's a miracle of asymmetry. It sports a theme that gives me the feels. Choices are layered so much that alpha gaming is virtually impossible despite it being a co-op without any specific specific rule or game system preventing it. A great idea that was developed into something truly monumental. 
And uh, I, I sign off here in, in my written review with Neurosis Grumbles in the Darkness. Apparently, I thought that was funny. <laughs> Spirit Island, just holy crap. Like, I had this is a game that I had no idea, no idea. And it just took me by surprise, took me by storm. And, and to me, it is one of those games where if I said, you know, it's a, I feel like it's a desert island game, basically. Yeah, the, the hype on this one has been pretty big. I've been following this one, um, the, mainly you talking about it and other uh, podcasters uh, yakking about it. But uh, I actually got to see a copy. It looks really, really nice. And I do, the theme seems really intriguing. And in fact, that's a co op game that has won you over. Uh, makes me uh, think that uh, I'm going to have to run this down sooner rather than later. But now I've got Rising Tide, I've got Iberian Rails, and i still got to listen to the other three you're probably going to mention. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, got, I only got one more, man. I'm down to one. Okay. But before I get to there, I want Trent to give his two cents. Uh, this is Pandemic, really well done with a really good variable player powers, like rich, rich variable player powers. You feel like you actually have decisions regarding who you are. Yep. And that makes it very interesting. It makes it a very enjoyable game. Yeah, it's not just a, I'm this guy, thus I do this. Within your player power, you have different paths and different decisions to make based on you know what you're in, uh, evaluating as being the, the best path for you to go. It's There's not just a scripted start to this game, even though you have variability, which is just crazy. And now, the last game into your world. Uno! So, it's, I guess it's a little bit less climactic than other lists that just kind of work towards – uh, this, but honestly, like these games in this tier, um, you know, I, I, I don't think I'm going to be redoing uh, my top 100 games or however many games because I just don't like I don't like the number being assigned to every single one. You know, I, I, I know that that's popular. I know that others love that and, and it creates some sort of drama and makes people feel like, you know, oh, well, now I only have to get these games, you know, as opposed to all the other games because these are the top five. No, there's like, you know, it's never that simple. And so I had four games in my tier one, and the last one of those is probably pretty easy for Trent to guess, Gloomhaven. And my my saying about that is short. Despite what my role-playing friends think, I'm not allergic to a good story. I just expect a solid game from my tabletop experiences. Gloomhaven lets me have theme and story together with mechanical depth. That's why it belongs here on Tier 1. It has more work put into it than probably an entire battery of, of storytelling games of a different st style, you know? And what I mean by that is, like, a game in 10 expansions would have still less content than what you get in the one box of Gloomhaven. Yeah, Gloomhaven, uh, we finally got the... Um, we, did, uh, we didn't get the initial print run. We got the second print run off Kickstarter. Sure. And um, I was blown away by the amount of content in that box i mean but what you get in that is what fancy flight with descent is going to charge you over 400 bucks for and that's over months of expansions and little figures you buy and everything else and then add on top of the value a really intriguing card-based combat system Wow, that it's everything it's, at once, man. It's, it's everything at once, and it's even got a slight legacy feel to it because you, when you only certain you can only get new characters if you retire your previous one. So, like opening up a new box, like Ooh, what's this new character going to be? Because you just have the symbol, right? Oh, it's just it's nuts. And what's even crazier about the whole thing is the only board in that board game is a track you use to put stickers on to see where you can go. <laughs> Other than that, it's useless. The it's whole literally thing, just a map, yeah. Yeah, it's just a it's a board map. I I mean, I I didn't even know you liked this game, and I played it. And I was like, holy crap! Joe has to play this thing. You have <laughs> got to look at this. This is unbelievable. Like, yeah, I was already my number one. I'm like, okay, I'm late to the party. <laughs> <laughs> but still, I just can't believe the value. I mean, it's just absurd the value in that box. <laughs> Well, that pretty much does it. I know Trent's feelings on Gloomhaven are very mixed. Yes, and I'm not gonna I'm not gonna poop on the party, so we'll leave it at that. <laughs> I have mixed feelings on Gloomhaven, and we'll leave it there. Certainly, yeah. Well, when everybody is going as crazy as they have been going, I would like to just point out, Trent. I started going crazy before anybody else started going crazy. You know, I I now have this weird feeling like you know my top game on my list 
is the same game on the top of Tom Vassell's list. And, you know, so now I just can't constantly crap on him anymore. <laughs> no, it's totally like kidding there, but it's, it's just strange because it it's, that's the beauty of Gloomhaven is that it can take somebody like me who's, you know, has such a different taste, but bring us together for that, especially at the top of our lists. You know, somebody like Tom Basil who's been reviewing for so long and seen so many games. The GBU is now a proud member of Punchboard Media. Escape the tower at punchboardmedia.com. Go ahead. Make my day. Anyhow, it's about time for us to kick into our hype section. And right. I'd like to hear. Yeah, I'd like to. Why don't you go, TC? You seem a little excited here. Oh, I'm very excited. Um, I finally got a, a copy of Dungeon Pets, which came off a recommendation from you, Joe. And as for Kate to play. And ever since you mentioned it, Kate's been like, I want to try, I want to try it. I'm like, well, I don't know. It does seem really heavy, but we, I got a copy. We put it together. I am very excited. I know it's an older game. It came out in 2011. I couldn't believe that. I'm like, oh, my God, this game's five years almost. You yeah, have five, six years old at this point. Seven I say, years old now. I seem to recall when this game came out. Holy cow. Can't believe I've waited this long to actually try it out. But, oh, it, it looks fantastic. The rules seem pretty. It's, it's a heavy game, but it seems all the rules and actions of the game tie into the theme. So it may not be as complicated to learn. And it's something that Kate will be invested in. And the artwork. Oh, my goodness. The artwork in this thing. Those pets are awesome. Those pets are <laughs> And even in the rule book, each pet has its own description. Like there's Fuzzy and Snake Kitty, which Kate was like, just like, ah, oh, look at that, Snake Kitty, yay. Um, I haven't seen Kate this enthusiastic about a game in a very long time, so I'm quite excited to try this one out. Well, I really hope it goes well. The same artist did Iberian Rails and Dungeon Lords. Oh, yeah. And in fact, uh, I even mentioned Kate was like, well, I want to play a game where I can be evil. I'm like, well, there's this other game called Dungeon Lords. <laughs> <laughs> that is see you have the yeah. evilometer. You literally have an evil meter. Yeah, in I told her that's like yeah. you could be evil. That's and, gonna be um, her step into Euro games, man, because it's like Euro game evil. You know, it's like you're evil, but everything evil is kind of in a system that interacts in an interesting way, which is a hallmark of Euro games. So, yes, TC, yes, one yeah, and, uh, and, it's, <laughs> and then um, you know, this is gonna be good because it's gonna. I think this has reignited a passion for because I I like Euro games. I really do. And then, like, oh, good, a good theme, a, a great designer, and my family's invested in it. Yes. Oh, I can't wait till next week to talk about this one. Hype, 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 hype. <laughs> Yay. Well, I'm really happy to hear you say that, man. I'm glad you were able to track down a copy, too. That probably wasn't anything easy. That wasn't too difficult. But, yeah, I'm just – I was just – oh, yeah. I, I could do, if I could bring Kate in right now and talk about it, she'd just be like, just blah, 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 blah. <laughs> nice. Awesome. Well, uh, thanks for that, TC. That's Dungeon Pets. Again, by Vlada, however you say his name. Vlada. <laughs> and uh, now, up, uh, it's going to have to be Trent, because mine kind of dovetail off of yours. Okay, uh, mine is going to be uh, Yellow and Yonsei by uh, Rainer Kinesia. It's, uh, basically, he describes it as a sequel to Tigris and Euphrates. And Tigris and Euphrates is one of my favorite games I've ever played. I deeply, deeply love that game. It's one of his 90s titles that I absolutely love. Uh, the difference with this one is it seems to be rather than four different colors, players are trying to manage five different colors. And rather than square tiles, you have hex tiles. Other than that, from what I can tell, it seems fairly similar. So I'm really looking forward to at least very least trying this. It's supposed to come out at Gen Con. And it is absolutely probably the I mean, it's almost surely going to be the first thing I try when I walk into that dealer hall. Mm-hmm. That's about all I got to say. Which tickets are now on sale for? Yep, already got them. <laughs> I'll be there. Um, so, Trent, I, I must have got a little confused here. I had that you were going to hype Tokyo Metro, um, which because we missed out on that from last week. I, honest, I honestly got confused as to which week we were on. So, because cool. we, well, we already have notes worked on for the next episode. So I <laughs> we do, we're yeah. We're a little bit ahead of time on that one. Yep, so... Um, the, the games I'm going to talk about, uh, are, are, are the, uh, so there right now is a Kickstarter running that has, um, Tokyo. It's like a Tokyo series. I think is what it's called by Jordan Draper, who is a designer that 
where like his favorite game is Container, um, which if if you're familiar with Container and you like economic games, it's like one of the classics of economic games. And um, he designs games that are kind of in that same style, but tend to have more designy elements to it. Uh, Container's more freeform than Jordan's designs tend to be, but you can tell very much where his heart lies. And the Tokyo Game Series is just uh, spans the entire hobby genre, I would say. Just all, all genres in the hobby. You go from dexterity games um, and silly, you know, silly fast tech bat games um, in this in this uh, package that involves like a drink machine that's really like a dice tower that you drop drinks in. Um, and then the the other games are like the, there's one of them that's like a one of them that's like a dexterity game as well that's about building up your your weird building as fast as you can. And then finally Tokyo Metro um, is like a stock. It, it looks kind of like a winsome or cube rail style game except you're playing on the Tokyo Metro. Um, and it involves you taking actions from these card decks that sort of cascade downwards, almost in a in a, in a, like a Lawrence uh, or a Lorenzo El Magnifico way. But you're not buying the cards; you're just taking an action on the card, and that action continues to go down until it finally um, resets, and and you start you you go through different phases of different actions. So, anyhow, um, I'm really really excited for the entire Tokyo series, um, and it's one of those where. It's the only thing right now on Kickstarter I'm backing at the moment, but I'm backing it for the whole kit and caboodle. Me too. Wow. Okay. <laughs> so they really excited for that. And actually, gentlemen, we are at the ending point. <laughs> yeah. We actually, even though I was really worried here uh, that we were going to go over time, We've actually made this one of the shorter episodes we've done recently, so that's that's a We're bit getting better. We're getting better. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it helps when I have everything kind of like planned and written down beforehand. That's not always going to happen, but anyhow, um, that's my top games of 2017. Um, I would love to hear your comments. You can send me uh, comments or your own list. I would be really curious, and you might see a contest coming out fairly soon where I'm not going to announce anything official, but you know, just now unofficially send me what your top games of the year were uh, to goodboardugly at gmail.com. And I'd love to, to start a dialogue with you there. Um, or you could just send it to me uh, on board game geek. If you, if you're in the good board ugly guild or the Longview guild, you'll see my posts there and be able to contact me that way. I'd love to hear what our community uh, here at the good, the board and the ugly is loving about this last year. And uh, you know, I think that it's the type of year that's going to keep me going for a long, long time in terms of excellent designs that, that uh, I was able to play. So um, anyway, thank you guys so much for being a part of this. Uh, I, I'm the host of The Good, The Board, and The Ugly, Joe Salon. I've been joined by T.C. Reed out in Portland. Thanks for hey, joining me, T.C. You're welcome. And Trent Ham here, my, my faithful co-host um, from my local group. Hello. Goodbye. Hello. Goodbye. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, goodbye. Hello, goodbye. <laughs> That's been this episode of The Good, The Bored, The Ugly. Hope you have a great week of gaming and catch us next week on The Good, The Bored, and The Ugly. <laughs>